afternoon everyone so i'm a rheumatologist and we do use steroids they are the anchor drugs so steroids are you know widely used for all inflammatory uh, connective tissue diseases right from rheumatoids to vasculitis to lupus and so on and in fact they are they play a very uh, important role in the management of particularly life threatening connective tissue diseases unfortunately they do have their own share of side effects which we all know so it's all started almost 75 years back when you know the, the first patient received a uh, compound e or which was cortisone and with dramatic results but within 3 years the doctors at the mayo clinic they listed down their this common observations and which were uh, whether they can use it in patients with damaged joints with little inflammation what is the optimum dose can we reduce the dose fast use single dose or uh, multiple doses and what they noted was inadequate supervision of uh, you know patients what should we do during time of surgery so by that time the side effects of steroids had already come into fore and because of indiscriminate use and now almost 70 years from that day uh, these are the you know uh, the topics which we still read in our articles to treat or not treat ra with glucocorticoids a debate and how do you balance the benefits and harms so in 70 years we are still struggling with what is the optimal way in which steroids can be used and these are all the milestones a very good slide and it uh, you know it tells you most of the things about steroids right from you know 1940s to 2018 so if you it's a very big slide and so from 65 to 94 there was what they have said a peri period of you know relative scientific silence but you know by 90s short term steroids bridging therapy and then for all the guidelines started giving some you know criteria to how we should be using steroids so in, in in rheumatology we have a lot of guidelines and how to use steroids in host of uh, rheumatoid diseases for the uh, students uh, whenever we interchange steroids you should look at the equivalents so if you are changing from prednisolone to deflazacort to methylprednisolone this are how the doses changes in 2002 we had the first uh, you know uh, the nomenclature of steroids was uh, finalized so in practice we try to divide patients you know and how to use steroids in them in the terms of whether it's a low dose whether it's a medium dose whether it's a high dose and accordingly uh, the rheumatological diseases are treated so if you look at this uh, slide here so for rheumatoid you normally require low or medium dose uh, medication conditions like vasculitis lupus you would require medium to high dose so the steroid dose for you know all these ctds are dis pre decided so in some uh, medica uh, rheumatological disease you don't require high dose like the joint manifestations of rheumatoid arthritis seldom requires more than 10 mg of prednisolone but you have a patient with rheumatoid with vasculitis then it goes the dose goes to 60 mg so all these doses are predefined and in terms of trial data uh during the last century the the treatment uh, pyramid of rheumatoid was you know the original pyramid where the demards came later so first was just watchful expectancy and demards or steroids to be used in patients who have very severe disease but early last uh, begin of the century this pyramid became inverted and now what we do is we early diagnose any of the rheumatological problems and start demards and steroids are basically use during flares or as a bridge and you can increase you know it can change the mar you can add biologics and you can go to experimental treatment so this pyramid is inverted now and uh, so in steroids why we use steroids they are very effective immunosuppression and anti inflammatory molecules rapid onset of action cost effective helps to attain disease control very early so there is a window of opportunity in rheumatoid you know just like we have a window of opportunity in uh, heart attacks so you have to treat rheumatoid during that window of opportunity so when we talk about efficacy we have enough trial data to see that they are efficacious and we look at two aspects one is controlling disease activity and secondly delaying the progression of joint damage so ular you know they specifically looked at uh, the steroids since uh, 2010 and the the low dose steroid has been shifted to short term so you can use any steroid but you have to stop them by Three months, so you can use oral, IM, IV, whichever way. But you have should have an endpoint that you are going to stop them by three months. So short-term steroids are 
consider whether you initiate treatment or you change therapy. And you can use any regimes or doses, but so long you stop it or make an attempt to stop it is more important. The side effects are all known. So you have the positive side effects on the top and all the negative side effects, you know, the host of them, which we are very well aware of at the bottom. So there is truly no safe dose of glucocorticoids. Huh? But you know, uh, despite some undisputed beneficial effects, there are still fear of potential side effects and that really has a limited factor in private practice. So prolonged doses are always used with multiple side effects. And whenever you choose uh, this steroid, you should look at the treatment related as well as the patient related. Both the uh, things have to be taken into consideration. Again, these are all the side effects which we all know. And then, you know, ULAR and all the international societies, they try to give us some advice and so long term use, usage is six months. And what we really worry about are four side effects, osteoporosis, cardiovascular disease, hyperglycemia infections. So they said that less than five, the risks are acceptable. More than 10, a strict no. Between 5 and seven, uh, 10, it's a gray area. And when we look at this, these are the, uh, all the risk factors. So you have this positive, uh, negative risk factors, and these are these preventive risk factors, which we should always tell the patient when we start them on steroids. So, you know, diabetes, exercise, weight loss, infections, vaccinations, osteoporosis, again, exercise, vitamin D, calcium, treatment, which we just spoke about, again, cardiovascular risk. So, if you tell all this patient all these things, the risk of whatever the side effect comes will be less. And then this is the guideline which we just spoke about. So whenever you put a patient on steroid, we always try to, you know, differentiate what the risk is going to be based on the FRAC scores or the DEXA scans. And once the patient is on steroid, you can decide whether the patient is into low risk, high risk, very high risk, and then the ones question which you had asked, you decide which agents are to be used. Can always refer to these slides and then this is how this is all based on trial data it's not something which i feel or any particular doctor feels since we are in an orthopedic setting a perioperative use also guidance have been given so previously supra physiological doses were covered during perioperative management and they found out that you know it really does not make a difference so the endpoint which were really looked at were uh, hypotension and infections okay so in terms of hypotension, it did not make a difference whether you give a supraphysiological dose or not. But when you give supraphysiological doses, the risk of in hyperglycemia and infection increases. So here, patients with a higher GC dose were more likely to have diabetes and other complications. And this risk now increased by almost 10% for every 10 milligram per dose. Wound healing can be affected even with low doses. So chronic low dose steroid also is a risk factor for wound infections. So patient education is very, very important. You know, you have to really explain to the patient that why you are starting the patient on steroid, what are the potential risks, and how do you mitigate this risk? And you know, you intervene appropriately. Also tell the patient about uh, you know, HPA suppression, because if you taper the steroid and stop it suddenly, they can get a flare of something like an Addisonian, and that can be perceived as a flare of rheumatoid. So that also you have to tell them that we gradually will try and stop it. And if possible, you can always check a ATM random cortisol. So, so consider all the comorbidities. So you have a patient with rheumatoid without any comorbidities, very easy to treat. But a rheumatoid with diabetes, with ischemic heart disease, with chronic kidney disease, on anticoagulation, the choice of therapies differs, you know. So patients who are in these comorbidities, it require a very tight control to manage the uh, risk benefit ratio. And also always select the appropriate dose, you know, just because the patient has a rheumatological problem, you just have, don't have put on an X dose, you know, the doses which I mentioned, you have to, you know, use those doses. And whenever the patient is there, you should always constantly review these doses. So in this is my last slide. So we use uh, all treatment with conventional demands and a step down approach in what we call as tit to target, timely tapering of glucocorticoids. Always remember in sub patient, you won't be able to taper and stop it also. And whenever there is, you are unsuccessful, then you can always consider chronotherapy. So what is chronotherapy is that, you know, the circadian rhythm is, is uh, issued. So patient with rheumatoid, they have what is known as a relative glucocorticoid deficiency, which is worst at night. And that coincides with the cytokine surge. So in those patients, you can use this modified release preparations or a steroid at night. So finally, last slide is, uh, you know, Professor Frank Budgarrett, he is the one who has done a lot of research in steroids in uh, CTDs. And what he says is that every milligram that helps control is, is a good milligram. 
but every milligram we can spare is an even better one thank you thank you